All right guys, Murph's here. And today we're gonna talk about this. A Mark 12 inspired AR-15 build that I have termed the Mark 12 Mod Murph or Mod M. Now, in order to talk about this, we are gonna have to talk about a little bit of history. Now, if you're looking for some deeper dives into designated marksman concepts and all that kind of stuff, I actually have two videos that kind of address a lot of things involved in that you should totally check them out the links will be in the description however we are going to discuss the history specifically of the mark 12 before rolling into the actual layout and parts that i selected for this rifle so to keep in mind guys this is typical of my ar-15 build videos this video is probably going to be a little long so if you're in a hurry go ahead and check the description jump to the areas that you want to actually consume learn about all those types of things and if you've seen any of my previous ar-15 reviews you probably know what i'm going to say about a couple of different portions so go ahead and skip over those and jump to the ones that you actually want to pay attention to now the Mark 12 actually came together from a couple of different competing designs in the late 90s. In the early 90s, the Marine Corps conducted some war games around urban warfare, and they identified it identified a resurgence for the need of the DMR. Now, it might seem kind of odd to a lot of people that urban warfare is what precipitated the need for a designated marksman. However, if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Most people, whenever they think of urban warfare, they're thinking of a lot of like house to house or CQB type situations. And those definitely happen, don't get me wrong. But in different high populated areas, there are still long shots to be made. There's long streets, there's tall buildings, all those types of things. And there's definitely gonna be a need to be able to A, conduct overwatch type operations, as well as be able to B, identify threats in those different types of positions. That is where a designated marksman's rifle comes in. However, a light designated marksman is still advantageous because they're able to conduct closer range fighting as well and be able to use the same intermediate cartridge as the rest of the squad. Now that's not to say that a full power rifle cartridge wouldn't be helpful in a lot of these urban type scenarios as much as to say that since the shots are not necessarily going to be consistently long and might be taking closer range shots the 5.56 or any type of intermediate cartridge makes sense. Keep in mind, doctrinally in the military, a rifleman drops off at 300 yards. That's their max effective engagement distance doctrinally. And a sniper picks up at 600 yards. So there's a three to 600 yard gap there. Now a sniper can of course engage at a closer distance and would be encouraged to do so in order to be able to increase the probability of first round impact. However, there's not that many snipers on the battlefield to be able to be fragged out to every squad in order to be able to expand their overall capability. As well, we're talking about the 90s where it wasn't that common for everybody to have an optic. So we're primarily working with iron sights. And though you can engage with iron sights at distances greater th than 300 yards, being able to identify an enemy at that distance utilizing iron sights is gonna be kind of difficult, especially if they don't wanna be seen. Whereas magnified optics can kind of change that balance in the favor of whoever it is is on the side with magnified optics at that point so a couple of different people go a couple of different ways developing this process the marines would wind up going with the sam r which is more or less an accurate m16a2 the navy would wind up going specifically the navy seals would wind up going with the recce rifle which would be a 16 inch m16 carbine i guess you could refer to it and Fifth Special Forces would actually wind up developing a their own kind of accurized M, uh, M16A2. In the late 90s, Naval Service Warfare Crane, which is more or less kind of like the weapons developmental side of Navy SEALs to put it into, or SOCOM, it, to put it into like very broad terms, decided to go ahead and start paying attention to the project. And what they came up with was a kind of amalgamation of a lot of different parts that these groups had already come up with. Now, there's quite a bit of debate around a couple of different things. First off, there was barrel length. Some people want to go with 16 inches in order to be able to have a fairly portable package, while other people want to go with 20 inches in order to be able to make sure that they're getting all the velocity capability out of the 5.56 cartridge, as well as work around the already established M16A2 barrel. Pretty much everyone agreed that the M16A2 barrel was not going to cut it for the purposes of accuracy. And ultimately, 18 inches would be agreed on for a good trade-off between velocity and portability. Now, in addition to that, there was the SOP mod program that was going on at the same time. And that was meant to be able to establish a bunch of different upper receivers that could be swapped out onto an M4A1 lower in order to be able to optimize for different requirements, say 10.3 for CQB type operations, a 14.5 for standard carbine type uses, and then an 18 inch barrel for precision rifle type uses. This is where we get the special purpose receiver designation from for the early Mark 12s. 
However, ultimately that was that idea was scrapped because it was felt that the Mark 12 would better benefit from a non-mil-spec trigger, and they didn't necessarily want to give everybody a non-mil-spec trigger. So, ultimately the Mark 12 got its own complete rifle setup as well as a separate designation still utilizing SPR, in this case, Special Operations Precision Rifle would be what SPR stood for. Now, initially they would do this off of M16A1 lowers because Crane had a bunch of those lying around and they wanted to go ahead and use them up. And this would be the Mod Zero designation. Eventually, we would get the Mod One, which would have M4 st type telescoping stocks. Now, the Mark 12 was exceedingly popular in the special operations realms and would account for a lot of enemy casualties during the global war on terror. However, ultimately, it would be superseded and replaced in 2017. Now, this still has a bit of a cult following in a lot of different realms. There's a lot of pop culture references to it from movies and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people like to pursue building out clone correct Mark 12s. I was not necessarily looking to do that. Maybe I'll do that at some point in the future. But my purposes were to put together something that I would want to use if I had all of my choices satisfied in a combat type environment. So with that being the case, guys, let's go ahead and talk about what it was that I was specifically looking to be able to capture with this rifle so that as I talk through our pieces and parts, we can decide whether or not I actually met my goal. Now, since we're talking about the lighter end of the, the DMR realm, we're really looking at kind of that closer to 300 yard or 300 meter engagements. So like three to five, being able to push out to six if I needed to, but primarily looking at fighting, if I'm employing this rifle, uh, fighting around 300, 400-ish type frame, and then also being able to utilize it in a close range type setting. Not necessarily being the first guy through the door on a stack should we have to do some CQB type stuff, but being able to hold my own in a CQB type operation in order to be able to facilitate what everyone else is that it's doing, should I find myself in some sort of scenario where I'm in a squad in some dystopian future, you know what I mean? Like, obviously we're, we're pretty far down the rabbit hole of realms of how this could get used, at, but I wanted this to be how it is that I planned out this build to be able to function in these types of environments. And I also want to be able to build it around the 5.56 cartridge to be able to have interchangeability in magazines and ammunition, obviously with a squad, but you know, not. I'm not running with a squad anytime soon, but I do have a bunch of other AR-15s, so there's something to be said for having interchangeable ammunition and magazines for those. Now, let's go ahead and start getting into parts and all that kind of stuff. Starting off right off the bat, we have an Anderson Manufacturing Receiver Set. Now, there's quite a few people who probably just scoffed, and I gotta say, I don't blame you. I initially would have done the same. Here's the deal, when I decided to get into this build, there were not a lot of parts available, and there were definitely not a lot of parts available for prices that I actually wanted to pay. A buddy of mine had an Anderson receiver set that he purchased prior to the start of the pandemic, had already installed a lower parts kit and just never got around to doing anything with it. He was moving and he was looking to get rid of it. So I started doing a bunch of research on Anderson lower receivers, well, receiver sets in general. And Obviously, there's a lot of controversy around them. There's a lot of people who cite a lot of different issues with them and all this kind of stuff. And most people who are, are pro Anderson manufacturing will talk about how there's only X number of forges in the country. So pretty much every AR manufacturer is getting their stuff from the same people. So it doesn't really matter. However, my only counter argument to that is that does not mean that everyone's getting the same quality products from those locations or that they're doing good QC on those products from those different types of locations. So Anderson has had a couple of issues with quality control. Sometimes it's the finish, which is something that's easily rectified. You can go ahead and get it Cerakoted, refinished, whatever it is that you need to do. Sometimes it's the roll marks, which is entirely a pride of ownership thing. It has nothing to do with function. But what's more concerning to me is sometimes it's like the pins the pinholes and all that kind of stuff don't necessarily line up or they're out of spec. I had a friend of mine who was putting together an Anderson lower, part, uh, Anderson lower kit and managed to break out his trigger guard while trying to install the roll pin. So that's concerning. And what previously caused me to be uninterested in Anderson receivers. 
up until I couldn't find anything for a price that I wanted to spend. And ultimately, I wound up convincing myself to buy this receiver off of my friend, one, because I was majorly bitten by the itch, I gotta admit, but also because he had managed to install a lower parts kit into it, which meant that at the very least, all the holes should be in spec and I shouldn't have any issue with being able to assemble a functioning rifle at that point. We'll get into that more here after a little bit. But that's what drove me to do this. Now, if you guys have seen any of my previous AR-15 reviews, you might as well go ahead and skip ahead now because for the receiver aspect of this, we don't have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about that you haven't heard before. For the rest of you, I have on this rifle a forward assist. This is a standard requirement for me. A lot of people like to argue about forward assists. I consider the argument to be completely pointless. Most people will say, well, you know, Eugene Stoner didn't want a... Uh, forward assist on the rifle, uh, forward assist is going to cause more harm than good. When have you ever used a forward assist? I actually use a forward assist quite frequently. A lot of times whenever I'm doing press checks or I'm in a dry environment or something like that, sometimes the bolt doesn't make it all the way into battery and it's not a bad thing to go ahead and press the forward assist. The important thing to keep in mind, guys, is that this is not a reset button. This is a tool, just like anything else. It has its time to be used and it has its time not to be used. A lot of times people say, well, if you've got some sort of obstruction in the chamber, you shouldn't be mashing on the forward assist. It's just gonna make things worse. And they're right. So don't do that. That was a short conversation, but that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like there's a time and a place to utilize literally every tool and every practice out there. Just because it exists doesn't mean that you have to use it. Just because you can use it doesn't mean it's gonna solve your problem. Enough about that. All right. The brass deflector, core standard brass deflector. Guys, I have a left-handed shooter in the family, and then I also quite frequently do transitional shoulder-type shooting. So I like having a brass deflector around. The... Wow, I just had a complete brain fart there. The dust cover, there we go, found it, I found the word. Uh, the dust cover, standard requirement for me. This keeps the system sealed up whenever it is that I'm not shooting. Due to a lot of courses and evaluations that I've taken in the past, I am habitual about making sure that my dust cover is closed anytime the rifle is not actively shooting. Uh, safety wise, we have a single side safety, which you know, to each their own on that type of thing. I'm not a big fan of ambidextrous safeties, but I can work around ambidextrous safeties. It, uh, my original training, especially when doing like support side shooting was based off of single side safeties. So I am very used to operating a safety with my non-shooting hand, but I can operate a ambidextrous safety just as easily. It's kind of one of those things that I orient myself to whatever particular rifle I'm using that day before it is that I go through whatever course of fire. We have standard magazine release, standard bolt release, standard magazine well, all those types of things. We do have uh, M4 feed ramps, all that kind of stuff. Uh, our pistol grip used to be an A2. I have dremeled off the A2 bump because I can't stand A2 bumps. And I don't get broken up about a lot of things on pistol grips, but A2 bumps really annoy me. They cause a lot of like a, a, a hot spot on my finger and all that kind of stuff actually breaks the skin. So it's something that I eliminate. However, I don't dislike them so much that I'm going to go buy a whole new pistol grip when this one came with the receiver set. I'll just go ahead and dremel that portion off. Would I like something that's maybe a little bit more vertical? Would that be a little more comfortable on, on my wrist and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure, but you know, I'll upgrade that at some point in the future. For right now, this does exactly what it is that I need it to do. All right, now, I think, well, oh, yeah, duh. So we have a standard M4 receiver extension, buffer tube set up, and then we have a Fab Defense adjustable buttstock that a buddy of mine gave me some years ago. All right, cool. So that's our receiver set. Let's go ahead and talk about our barrel. So I spent a lot of time looking at barrels, spent a lot of time researching barrels and getting really excited about some like really high quality barrels to then find that they were either out of stock or wildly over MSRP. So what I ultimately wound up going with was an 18 inch ballistic advantage one in seven twist, 4150 chrome molly steel, one in seven twist, if I didn't already say that, 556 five, chambered QPQ coated barrel with a rifle length gas system. I think I probably repeated something in there and I apologize for that. Anyway, let's go ahead and break this down into portions here. 556 five, chambering. Originally, I wanted to go with the 6.5 Grendel up until I looked around for ammunition and there was no 6.5 Grendel around. So at that point, I chose not to go with 6.5 Grendel and chose to stick with instead 5.56, which like I mentioned before, ammunition commonality, magazine commonality makes a lot of sense. Now, one in seven twist, that's perfect for this type of barrel. This rifle should be meant for heavier grain ammunition and the one in seven is perfect for 62 grain on up. And we'll talk about 
accuracy more here after a little bit. 4150 was not necessarily my pursuit at the time as much as it was acceptable. The original Mark 12 and a lot of these other early AR-15 precision designs were built around stainless steel barrels and I would have been totally fine with that. I just wound up selecting this barrel first. QPQ coating. Now, there's a lot of different discussions when it comes to accuracy and coatings and all that kind of stuff. And most of them actually bridge around the, wow, I am really struggling today, guys. I don't know what's up. Chrome lining. I don't know why that was hard. So a lot of it comes back to chrome lining. So a lot of times you can run into an issue where your chrome lining is not consistent. Some areas are too thick, some areas are too thin, and it will cause some disruption to your bullets and it will negatively impact accuracy. But when it comes to nitriding, armonite, QPQ, all those types of surface treatments, they are actual surface treatments. They're actual hardening to the metal itself, not necessarily another material that's added on top of it. So you don't run into those issues that they don't have as big, theoretically, they don't have as big of an impact on accuracy. And only time will be able to tell on this overall. C. And I think that pretty much covered everything. 18 inches is of course sticking with what was more or less the standard for the Mark 12. I think it is a good trade-off between velocity and length. And then also we have a rifle length gas system, which is a softer recoiling system. Not to say that 5.56 in general is heavy recoiling as much as it's going to cause less disruption to my shots, which will allow me to better observe impacts, make corrections, all those types of things. All right, so that's our barrel, which is also cut for the Ops Incorporated number 12. And we'll talk about that more once we get to Muzzle devices. Now, let's go ahead and talk about this handguard. This is not a PRI handguard, as would have come on the standard Mark 12. Never, never, never been a big fan of those. So instead, I went with this Midwest Industries 14-inch lightweight M-lock rail. And I've got to tell you guys, I really like this rail. It's, it's excellent in its weight distribution, all this kind of stuff. It turns this into a very well-balanced rifle. Now, off of this, I am hanging a GG and G bipod, which is adjustable for both height as well as this one here, can't. I've had this lying around for years. I don't even know where or whom it is that I picked this up off of. It's just been bouncing around in my equipment for a long time, and I finally found something I was willing to use it on. Now, I also have a BCM low profile gas block under here instead of the PRI combination gas block flip up front sight. Never really cared for that setup. Again, it's kind of a visual thing. I'm sure it's very durable and all that kind of stuff, but I prefer to have my gas blocks covered by the handguard. Now, next thing I got after that, I have the Ops number 12 cut, which was the original cut that would have been found on the 18 inch Mark 12 barrels. And these were meant to be able to utilize a brake and collar system. As I started looking around, which that braking color system was also built for a specific suppressor that was heavily utilized by SOCOM in the 90s and early 2000s. Now, I spent a lot of time looking around for the appropriate brake and collar system to be able to go on this barrel and I was finding that they were out of stock pretty much everywhere I went. So I decided that instead I would go ahead and get a suitable substitute, more or less placeholder or thread protector at that point to go on this rifle up until the proper braking color system came into stock. But I decided before I did that, I would go ahead and contact Allen Engineering. Now, Ron Allen was the engineer who had a lot of, who had a lot to do with the Ops number 12 and the braking color system as well as the suppressor for the original Mark 12. That company, Ops Incorporated, I believe was the company, has gone out of business and now Allen Engineering Manufacturing has taken over those patents and all that kind of stuff and produces the braking collar system as well as the suppressors to be able to pair with this barrel. So I decided to go ahead and contact Allen Engineering to see if maybe they could give me an estimate on when these would come into stock to be able to see if perhaps it was worth waiting a little bit longer or to just go ahead with my suitable substitute plan. Now I was surprised when Ron Allen of Allen Engineering answered the phone and I described to him what it was that I had going on as far as, you know, I was looking around, I couldn't find any in stock, and I just wanted to get an estimate on when they would be available. He informed me that he was actually sitting down to his bench at that moment to go ahead and start producing a couple of these. Would I like to go ahead and order one? Well, of course, of course I would. Now, guys, keep in mind, whenever I talk about these 
these interactions that I have with manufacturers, I don't lead off with I'm on YouTube or I'm some sort of reviewer or any of those types of things. And honestly, they wouldn't care anyway because this is not a big channel. I, I'm, I'm not on the level of a lot of other YouTubers and all that kind of stuff where they would they would potentially get this message put out to like millions of subscribers. That's, that's not the case here. It, <laughs> I'm not at that point. So whenever I have positive interactions with these businesses, it's because they are just genuinely good businesses who are just looking to be able to help out the consumer. So I got the proper breaking collar system for my rifle direct from Mr. Allen, and I've really got to appreciate that. Now, what is the system? So you can see here we have a muzzle brake, which longtime subscribers of the channel will know that I dislike muzzle brakes. However, I was willing to make an exception because, well, this barrel was cut to be able to include these. Now the suppressor would attach to these threads here at below the muzzle brake, but it would actually center itself off of this collar system. So it threads completely, it slips completely over the barrel and threads into this uh, right below this muzzle brake here. And this gives this an exceedingly repeatable contact point for the suppressor, which means that you'll have less likelihood of a shift an impact based solely on installation of a suppressor. That's why I like taper lock systems. I don't, know any, I don't own any suppressors at this point. I plan on at some point owning suppressors. One of the things that really bugs me about suppressors, suppressors that you'll frequently hear discussed is that, you know, oh, I put the suppressor on and I have, you know, this shift and point of impact. And even if it's repeatable, I don't want there to be any shift and point of impact. I want there to be a certain amount of simplicity whenever it is that I'm utilizing my rifle for an engagement, regardless of presence or absence of different factors. So when it comes to the suppressor, I want there to be complete transparency on or off. My point of impact is going to be the same. And a taper lock system like this allows that to happen. Now, at some point I will add an AM5 suppressor. It's just on my to-do list. You know, I, my first emphasis was to get this rifle off the bench and into action. And I have succeeded with that. All right. Now, Let's go ahead and talk about the charging handle real quick. This is a mil-spec standard charging handle from Palmetto State Armory that I then ins uh, installed this extended latch onto. Got to be completely honest, guys, I would not do this again. I did this early on because I hadn't picked out a scope yet, and there's a good possibility that the scope is going to hang over the charging handle, and that would potentially obscure my ability to be able to grab the charging handle. As it sits now, that's not the case. As we can see, I have clear and easy access to the charging handle. But I left it in place just to further remind myself that I will never install another one of these extended latches because whenever I'm wearing equipment and I just let this rifle hang, this extended latch catches on the equipment or yeah, it catches on the equipment and winds up getting pulled back and all that kind of stuff. And it's really annoying. So do not recommend doing that. This little piece right there. All right. Now the bolt. The bolt that I have in here is also a Palmetto State Armor because parts were difficult to come by at the time. This is a nitri coated M16 profile 9310 bolt carrier group. Pretty standard overall. All right, so there's that. Let's go ahead and talk about this trigger. Now, once I got these parts installed and I started kind of playing around with the rifle, I noticed an issue with the trigger, and that was that it was not resetting. In fact, the only way to get it to reset was to either press on the trigger pins or press on the side of the trigger, and then it would reset. So now, all of a sudden, I was in a position where I wasn't sure if this was an issue with the the spec of the trigger pin holes or if it was the trigger itself. Now, I spoke to the original owner, and he indicated that he had bought a pretty cheap lower parts kit. So, what I decided to do was to buy another trigger, toss out the old one, replace the new one, place in the new one, and see how it is at this ramp. So, what I wound up getting was a CMC three and a half pound single stage curved trigger, which also happened to come with anti rotation nuts. So, I installed those and I've had no issues with the trigger ever since then. I don't know if removing these anti-rotation nuts would in some way impact that, but for right now they're going to stay because the trigger's operating just fine and I don't see a need to change that. So I've got to say this has been an excellent trigger, however it is light enough and it's the only single stage trigger that I have, especially at this weight, so sometimes it kind of throws me off whenever I'm shooting. All right, well, let's go ahead and start talking about optics. So 
The primary optic that I put on this is a Vortex Crossfire 2 2 to 7 by 32 with their dead hold BDC reticle. Now, why did I choose such a light power optic? Well, honestly, guys, because the engagement ranges that I'm planning on shooting are not that far. So I don't need a lot of power. And at two power, this is plenty to be able to work in closer quarters should I need to do so. As well as I have a lot of eye box behind this to where if I needed to be able to use this around different types of barriers and all that kind of stuff, I can utilize this optic quite well. I've actually recently, well, I got to be an assistant instructor at a rifle course where the engagement ranges went from five yards out to 260 and I worked this thing around a lot of unnatural positions utilizing the two power setting on this and had no problem engaging. And then once I got over to the only long range shot for the 260, dial this thing up to seven so that I could better engage that target. This thing performed just well. Now can't again with the BDC reticle and all that kind of stuff. You could get really complicated reticles with stadia lines for like every five yards and all that kind of stuff. For close range type fighting, I find that confusing to the eye. I would rather have a very simple reticle that still gives me stuff that I can work off of to be able to make corrections on the fly while allowing me to be able to better focus on my target whenever I'm fighting at a closer distance. So I like simplistic reticles on setups like this. If you're talking about a more precision-minded, longer range type setup, now those steady lines really start to become handy because I want to be able to have data to be able to make a first round engagement more probable. So that's what kind of drove me towards this. I wanted something at a, that kind of the lighter end of power that would still give me more zoom than what you would find on your average fighting rifle. Like, you know, now you can get variable power, low power variable optics all the way up to like one to 10, which I think is a tad too powerful for your average fighting type requirement. But one to six, I think is a really good kind of middle ground between having a designated fighting rifle and moving over into a DMR type concept. There's still a little bit more power. It's enough to be able to identify threats at a greater distance and increase your engagement capability while also being able to dial it back down and be able to take closer up shots effectively if you need to. Now backup sighting system. I went back and forth on this with my friends for quite a bit. My friends, I, I knew right off the bat with this, with this optic and having this worn tactical AR-15 type scope mount that was not QD, I was going to need some sort of rollover system because I did not have a way to be able to get the optic out of the way to be able to use iron sights like on the original Mark 12. And I have friends of mine who have rollover 45 degree offset irons. And that's a method. That's definitely something that you can do. However, I've never been a fan of 45 degree offset irons purely because it's two focal points that I'm now trying to align in a suboptimal position. I think we can all agree that this is kind of the optimal position to have your rifle oriented. Once you cant it this way, you've now moved into a suboptimal position. And a lot of times, if you're utilizing that dot, or if you're utilizing your rollover irons or whatever type of rollers, whatever type of backup system you have, you might be fighting in a suboptimal position, fighting around barriers, fighting around cover, fighting at close range. Perhaps you had your more powerful optic dialed up to seven, and now you've got some closer range stuff you gotta do, and you gotta go ahead and pivot over to your backup system. I would prefer something that is a single focal point, which is why I went with the Sig Romeo 5 red dot. This way, as soon as I get that dot, I'm good to go. There's no, there's no alignment. There's not even like an additional reference point that's needed. I can just focus on that dot. And as long as I have that dot on the target, I'm going to engage them somewhere on their body. That's one of the things that I really liked about the setup. And what's really great, I've got this currently set up in a True Glow 45 degree offset mount. I originally had it set in a, uh, I can't remember what the other one was. It was some cheap setup, some super cheap setup, and uh, it it broke. Long story short, I put it into a hard case, and when I opened it up, it had somehow managed to break it off of there. So I went over to a True Glow. I haven't had any issues with it yet, but here I'm on my reticle, and then
minor movement over and I've got my red dot clear and easy ready to go. So this has been a really great setup for me. I did run it during that course. I tried to make sure that I really emphasized running the red dot during the course so I could kind of get a feel for actually working around the system overall. All right, guys. Now, my sling is, of course, a Blue Force two-point adjustable sling. I really love two-point adjustables. I'm not in love with where it is that I have set up on this rifle. It chokes up a little too close to the body. I would like to stretch it out a little bit more, but that'll be a future refinement. All right, guys, so there's our features. How does it shoot? Early on, I had a couple of issues, and it was almost entirely based around the gas system. So I made a little loops, and initially I started off with the Strike Industries gas block. And I installed it, uh, dimpled the barrel, all those types of things, and then when I installed it, I utilized some red Loctite because it's going nowhere, and I did this right the first time, I hope. Took it out to the range, shot it, and immediately noticed that I had some cycling issues. So at that point, I played around with some ammunition. I played around with some buffers. I could not get the, the issue to resolve itself. I took it to my gunsmith who was like, all right, yeah, cool. That's all right. You know what? Let's, uh, let's check your gas block seatment, you know, seat seating real quick. And uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And then we had an uncomfortable conversation about the fact that I used red Loctite and that uh, apparently I used too much red Loctite and now the gas block was completely cemented to the barrel. So, oops. So that wound up having to get cut off and the area cleaned up and all, those, all that type of stuff and the new gas block was installed. I took it out to the range and I had the same issue. If anything, it actually got worse. So I brought it back home, took apart the system again, realigned it, checked it with some, uh, with some CLP and stuff like that to make sure that it was properly seated and then took it back out to the range where I finally got it back to where it was cycling before and now it was an issue of figuring out the buffer. So I tried a couple of different buffers. I threw in my LWRC's H2 buffer and that is when it finally started locking back properly instead of getting hung up on the magazine uh, itself. So at that point I ordered an H2 buffer, installed it and ever since then, I've had less issue. Now, one thing I've noticed, and I think this is entirely based off of gas system as well as the buffer, this thing does not like 223 ammunition. Wolf, or Tula, it'll straight up not run. It'll malfunction every time. However, with brass cased 223, it'll function most of the time, but it will still not properly lock to the rear. 5.56 ammunition is the only thing that allows this thing to lock properly to the rear. So as much as I don't like things to be ammo finicky, I was glad that I finally found something that this thing would run well. Now, accuracy wise, this is supposed to be a one MOA barrel with mass grade ammunition. With ammunition prices right now and availability and all that kind of stuff, I have run no match grade ammunition through this rifle, which is unfortunate because many years ago when I first kind of pictured this build in my head, that's exactly what I wanted to do. So all I have run through this rifle have been 55 grain ammunition. And I've got to be honest, with a 1 in 7 twist, I'm not getting the accuracy potential out of it that I know is there. So for the most part, as we can see here, at 100 yards with PMC, I've gotten this two and a half inch group. Again, with PMC 55 grain, I've gotten anywhere between 2.6 
and one and three quarters there in the middle. That's the best group that I've shown, that I've seen so far, or at least that I have record of so far. And then just yesterday with uh, 55 grain XM193 from American Eagle, I shot this two and three eighths inch group. So that's pretty much been the consistency for this rifle. About one and three quarters to just over two and a half inches. Now, is it meeting the accuracy that I think the rifle is actually capable of? No. Is it, however, meeting my DMR accuracy requirement of better than minute of man? Absolutely. So I would really like to see what this thing would do with higher grain ammunition. And at some point we'll get around to doing that, perhaps in a, in a update video at some point in the future, maybe do some comparison type stuff when I can. Now, as far as the gassing on this rifle now, like doing rapid shot strings, transitional shooting, all that kind of stuff, this rifle is wonderful. The muzzle brake does a great job of taming the rifle while not being obnoxious to the shooter. And as far as I know, no one else who's around me, people really haven't been complaining, but it is very easy to transition through a shot string and engagements and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I absolutely love about this rifle is the weight. Now, of course, being a little bit larger than your standard carbine, this thing is a little bit heavier than the standard carbine as well. In this configuration right here, it comes in at about 9.2 pounds, which is heavy right off the bat. It's definitely not as light as my go-to rifle, which is about seven-ish pounds. However, with how the weight is distributed on this particular rifle, it really holds this weight very well. I don't feel like I'm straining to try to keep it on target or any of that kind of stuff. It's very easy to be able to work with this rifle. It's actually a joy to be able to work with this rifle without the bipod attached. With the bipod attached, it does throw on a little bit of extra weight. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta kinda compensate for that, that weight being thrown out there whenever you're transitioning between targets. And it's about three quarters of a pound all on its own. So with bipod and this rifle set up as we see it here, it's just under 10 pounds kind of heavy, but it's not as heavy as a lot of other DMR options out there on the market. And I'm sure like if I swapped out this buttstock, I could get this thing a little bit lighter still. But overall, I am very happy with this setup. Having been able to run it through that course and do a little bit of work with it at the range and all that kind of stuff, I feel that I have made a very effective close to longer range DMR option. Something that'll spe specialize very well for those purposes, more so than perhaps like a, an M14 EBR or a lot of other 308 designated marksman's rifles would be able to do in the same type of capacity. All right, guys. I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you guys found this interesting. Now, just a little update for you guys for the channel. I have started a Murph's Law Facebook page. So, if that's something that you're interested in, if you want to be able to interact with this content more frequently, little updates and all that kind of stuff, teasers, all those sorts of things, go ahead, check the link in the description and join the page and add to it. Then, you know, I would definitely like to hear some feedback from you guys as far as stuff that you want to see or stuff that you want to talk about. So that's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.